to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hey everybody, Enobosarm, formerly known as Osterin GTX024 and MK2866, currently as Viru024, will be the first SARM we talk about in this mini-series. So as a quick reminder, a SARM is a selective androgen receptor modulator, so the goal of the compound is to preferentially bind the androgen receptor of a specific tissue type and thereby induce a targeted amount of androgenic and anabolic activity, predominantly the latter. Now this SARM, like many, is quite controversial. However, there is a decent body of research for us to dissect. In general, Osterine or Enobosarm is known as the most researched SARM, and we've got over two decades of data to sift through, so we'll try to point out the most important and relevant points here. There's even been some big pharmaceutical contenders that played a role in helping drive the product through clinical trials, particularly in the realms of cancer, its related muscle wasting, and cachexia. It's also been looked at in stress, urinary incontinence. So Osterine, like other SARMs, is an orally bioavailable androgen receptor agonist, thought to possess tissue-selective anabolic effects in muscle and bone, without the androgenic properties responsible for hair growth in women and and effects on the prostate in men, so possibly more sparing of estrogen and DHT. Oral bioavailability refers to the pharmacokinetic profile that allows it to be taken by mouth. It's also known as an aeropropionamide-derived SARM, which just describes the basis of its chemical structure. Its half-life is about 24 hours, although depending on what you read, you'll see it's labeled between 14 hours and a day. Now, some of the biggest players in research and development in the past were companies called GTX Inc. and Merck. But before we get into the current pipeline of research, let's take a look at some of the previous clinical trials. And if you have made it this far, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button. It's the best way to help me out. Thank you in advance. So we'll review the biggest series of trials, and then I'll put links that support all of these and give more details into the description below. So there have been trials in patients with breast cancer that looked at Anobisarm used to hopefully improve anti-tumor therapeutic activity and quality of life in these women who have androgen receptor positive breast cancers. There's also a series of trials called the POWER trials, prevention and treatment of muscle wasting in patients with cancer, that look at Anobisarm arm use in the context of cancer and chronic disease-associated muscle wasting. Earlier research demonstrated a dose-dependent improvement in total lean body mass in elderly men and postmenopausal women when they progressed to a phase 2b study, which took place in a patient population of individuals suffering from different types of cancers. In addition to increased lean body mass, there were also shown improvements in physical function and quality of life. This prompted the POWER Phase 3 trial to evaluate the SARMs use in patients initiating first-line chemotherapy for non-small cell lung cancer. And although the results don't seem to be available to the public, the current product developers show that the Phase 3 evaluations, which consisted of two trials, exhibited slight increases in lean body mass over 84 days, adjuncted to two different types of chemotherapy. And although there were different contenders in the past, now the biggest player in Osterine's development is a company called Vero Inc., a biopharmaceutical company based out of Miami interested in novel products for weight loss, breast cancer, and viral-related ARDS, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. And surprisingly, although a lot of the previous research was looked at in the realm of chronic muscle wasting illness, the biggest the biggest pipeline Anobasarm is involved in currently is in weight loss, management of obesity in combination with GLP-1 agonist therapy. It appears that Viru's goal is to essentially attempt to counter muscle wasting associated with GLP-1 therapy, as to create an adjunctive treatment using SARMs to prevent muscle loss while on products like semaglutide and terzepatide. We've actually talked about a previously discussed peptide being used in a similar context, and if you recall, that was actually bremelanotide, or PT-141. That said, the company acknowledges that there are implications for further research in the field of androgen receptor-positive breast cancers, but it seems to be limited at this point due to funding. Judging by earlier trials, some of the most predominant side effects appear to be headache, nausea, impairment in liver function as evidenced by elevated ALT, diarrhea, dizziness, back pain, constipation, vomiting, and general musculoskeletal pain, among some other possible adverse outcomes which we'll get into in a bit. 
And if you go through the sources I'll attach from Vero Pharma, you'll notice that there is of course a heavy bias considering they're the key developer at this point trying to capitalize on the GLP-1 agonist hype train, but they do have an overall strong collection of the data to browse over for your own education and convenience on your own time. Let's finish up by discussing Osterine's noted effects on testosterone, since the proposed anabolic properties are what draw a lot of people to the world of SARMs. And since these metrics were measured in healthy elderly men where you might expect the most drastic changes given the hypogonadal features of aging, the findings on serum hormone levels were generally unremarkable. It looks like there were no statistically significant changes in free testosterone, but that there were reductions in total testosterone and SHBG or sex hormone binding globulin in men. So although I can't speak for all SARMs at this point, it does appear that Osterine in particular likely doesn't have as much of an impact on sex hormones as we may think given its hype and mechanism. And and may in fact, on paper at least, have a testosterone lowering effect. While this was observed in the study, however, the clinical significance and variability among individuals are important, and this is something that would benefit from scientific replication and further research. But just to cap off our discussion, I think one of the biggest concerns I have about SARMs is likely to do with unpredictability. When a hypogonadal person hops on testosterone, despite the fact that testosterone is more non-selective and has anabolic and androgenic properties, the effects it has on our hormonal axis is quite predictable and pretty easily measurable, especially when compared to growth hormone secreting peptides. We know that by injecting exogenous testosterone, hypothalamic production of GnRH and pituitary production of LH and FSH will decrease, thereby inhibiting processes of fertility. We discussed in this case that from a measurement standpoint at least, testosterone levels with SARMs aren't really predictable and may even go down. However, given their mechanism to the body at least by binding to the androgen receptor, SARMs replicate the activity of androgens, notably testosterone and DHT. So it's not unlikely in my opinion that there may be suppression of this hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis. Because if androgen binding is increased, the signals that would promote testosterone production and spermatogenesis would subsequently lower. Lower. That's why some of the side effects that you may also see listed include infertility and testicular shrinkage, something else to keep in mind. Overall, this compound may be the most researched SARM, but that doesn't say much about the limited investigation that's been done into long-term impact and impact on hormonal levels, liver enzymes, and has maintained a lack of FDA regulation that brings into a similar concern with many peptides. Who the heck knows what you're getting into because there are no consequences if your product is impure, which seems among the better possible scenarios. In addition, it's been particularly looked at in a population of chronically ill individuals, which thereby limits our understanding into how it will affect hormonal levels and otherwise in an otherwise healthy person. That said, it's an interesting product proposed to have lower androgenic properties, which would paint it favorably in some contexts. But for the purpose of this video, it wasn't to convince you in either direction, but to educate you on what we've learned about SARMs over the past two decades, in particular with Osterine. I think given the possible clinical utility when we're thinking about optimized lean body mass and presence of AR positive cancers, and I would like to see them investigated in those contexts for years to come. Will they? Your guess is as good as mine. Overall, I tried to provide you with a comprehensive overview on the SARM in about 10 minutes or so, so we'll see if that goal lines up. If you are looking for a way to further support the channel, you'll see the link to the Patreon linked in the description below. I post all the updates on peptide research in particular. We started discussing some other things as well. The most recent video up there is on boron and its relationship to testosterone. All the resources consulted to make this video will be in the description below. Most importantly, thank you for watching and I hope you have a great day. Take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based, pull up a chair, let's get this straight, peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.